the buzz is already, you know, starting around the shops and whatnot. You know, people want to start getting geared up for the upcoming season. I, I, if this coming season is anything like the last two, that's the reason people are starting to get really excited because we got we've had some really good fishing. Yeah, that's a good thing, and that's what we've got you on. So one of the things that uh, if people who don't know who you are, uh, you've got the Tangled Tackle Fishing YouTube channel, and you kind of do like a seminar basically every week where you really kind of get into the details and stuff for people, and it's been incredibly popular. Your YouTube channel is doing super well, and just it's it's just interesting stuff. Um, one of the videos that you recently put out was how to catch more fish. And that seems really basic and really simple. It sounds like, yeah, okay, well, let's talk about that. But uh, right. it's one of those things that everybody wants to know how to do, and it's one of those things that there's a lot of different things that go into that. So why don't you give us a, a you know, we've got 15 minutes. Your video was, uh, you know, like 45 minutes, but why don't you just kind of give us a bird's eye view of what that was all about? Yeah, no problem. And thanks for having me on, guys, and the nice comments. I do appreciate it. So, yeah, I do run the, the uh, YouTube channel, Tangle Tackle Fishing. We've been out for about five years now. We've got a great group of people following. And you're right, every Sunday night at 7 p.m., we do a live stream, and we cover a lot of different topics. So thank you for bringing that up. But uh, these are the things, when I first started salmon fishing over 20 years ago, these are the things that I had no clue would affect the way the fishing is. Now, I grew up walleye fishing, pike fishing, bass fishing, pan fish, you know, anything like that, not salmon fishing. So these were the four things when I was finally lucky enough to learn them. And it, you never stop learning these things. But these were the four things that really the light bulb went on for me. So I'll, I'll go over the four things. And then if you want to get into more detail, I'm happy to do that. Let's do that. Okay. So the fourth thing, I got the, the seminar actually up on my screen right now. I streamed this last Sunday. But uh, the first thing is ghost town. You're, you're fishing in an area where there's no fish or the fish that are there are just not active. And I, I put that first because... That is probably the most common thing day to day to day to day. And everybody wants that, that magic formula where, hey, I go, I go put my boat down on this coordinate and I troll in that direction. I'm guaranteed to get 20 fish. And that just doesn't happen. Every day the fish turn off. Every day the fish move. So that's, that's one of the most common things. The second thing is uh, speed and direction. And current's playing that as well. Different speeds. And, of course, that big banner behind you that says uh, Fish Hawk. Am I reading that right? <laughs> That's what <Yeah>. it says. <laughs> I got my sticker up right there. But that was that was such a game changer for me to figure out speed, direction, currents, temperatures. The Fish Hawk is an absolute game changer. And there, there's nothing like it on the, on the market that's going to do a better job for you. So that's number two, speed, direction, and currents playing that as well. Number three is you're, you're fishing the wrong temperature, and I alluded to that already in number two, but you're out, you're out of the temperature that the fish want to be in at that time or that they're feeding in at that time. And then number four, and this is the last thing I change on a daily basis. I will go back and look at the, those first three things before I go anywhere near touching number four. Number four is color selection, lure selection. I will go back and I will try to dial in my boat, dial in my speed, dial in my temps long before I'll start changing up my baits. Yeah, very good. You know, Lance and I are looking at each other. Lance is chuckling over here. Not not because what you're saying is wrong, but basically, you know, he, he's <laughs> taking what you've got in four into eight. But essentially what you guys are saying is the same thing. So yeah. that tells us maybe that that you guys know what you're talking and about. I, I watch a lot of Chris's stuff. He does he does a great job on his YouTube stuff. So Thanks, Lance. Appreciate um, that. I, 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 it's really cool. You know, it, it's so funny. You talk to anglers. You come to a, a show like this, and everybody wants, you know, the, the latest bait and the latest color and this and that. And you're like, guys, that's not what it's about. And when you sit down and talk to good anglers, just be in the right spot. Do, do everything wrong with the wrong stuff. Just be in the right spot. You've got a chance at least, right, it, 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 in trying to get people to, to not think backwards, right, to start worrying about where you are before you worry about what you're fishing with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Like I, like I said, the last thing I do is change my colors. I look at everything else long before I do any of that. I don't go mad scientist on my rigs, and I don't change up my stuff that often. So Lance uh, kind of spelled out how he goes about finding fish on the Detroit River. And we talked about kind of an analogy with hunting and how that works with scouting. How do you find fish on a piece of water like Lake Michigan? I mean, it's a it's a big, giant piece of water. And, you know, there's lots of places where there isn't a ton of structure. 
So right. how do you go about kind of finding those spots to start? So one thing I've told people in the past is if you're just getting out there on the Lake Michigan and fishing, when you get a fish and you have a you have your GPS going, mark your waypoints with a date on your GPS. And at the end of the year, go back and either keep a logbook of all that or go back and look through the data. And that's one thing you can learn. You can start figuring out trends of where their fish are going to be, the depth, the color they liked, just by going back and looking at the dates over the last year or two. That was a that was taught to me a few years back by a charter captain, and that was a that was a big light bulb for me, moment for me when I went back and I looked at that data. And I saw in the springtime, the fish seemed to be here. In early summer, the fish seemed to be here at this depth. And they like this color at fall or early fall, late summer. They liked here and so on and so on. So that that was a big thing for me. Um, a couple other things you can do is just talk to people. Go out there, go to the cleaning stations, put on your favorite hook shirt or your favorite whatever, Costa shirt like I got on right now or DW shirt, blend in, go down to the cleaning station and just ask. People, the majority of people are going to be there that, that want to help you. You're going to get one or two. They're going to give you the cold shoulder. But the majority of people out there will give you some decent information. Bait shops are another great place. Make a circle of friends that you can you can interact with. Start a text group. Networking is huge. If I'm not on fish and I got three or four people that I can call and they say, hey, the fish are here. If you just come over here. Or if I'm on fish, I'm letting people know. Networking Without networking, I mean, I'd say the majority of charters out there are just running around in circles. We all talk to each other. So that's that's really the most basic things you can do to just start getting the information that you need. we got a question coming in here from Brian Nichols, and it was something I talked about uh, moments ago, but uh, he, I think he's just looking for a little more clarification here. Uh, when it comes to spring salmon, what do you think is more important, speed or temperature? Oh, I... They're both equally important, but but temperature, you got to watch. When the temperature starts getting up to 50 or above, those fish are going to start moving out deeper. Before that, you're going to be fishing in on the shorelines over the over the sandbars. But once that temperature starts creeping up above 50, you're going to start pushing off to deeper water. So if you don't know the temps, I guess that would be slightly more critical. And I, I think I think it's important that those two things are completely different. One is aware. And one is a how. If you get the how right and you're not in the right where, it doesn't matter. So yeah. I think w w when guys start talking about pieces of information, they have to start separating where from how. Not, you know, speed and temper, two completely different things, right? The right speed in the wrong place is irrelevant. <clears throat> so you, you got to start thinking about the where part and the how part separately i, I want to ask i want to ask chris a question sure so you talked you talked about keeping good records which which I, I love to do so on the detroit river i have a migration that i know the fish are going to do one two three four five six seven eight in that order every year though when i get there they're somewhere different in that process but once i figure it out after three or four days then i can follow the fish the rest of the year do you find that same thing with salmon fishing that you know there, there's a start and an end of the migration uh, and they go through very specific steps along that way once you figure out what step they are, it's fairly easy to stay on the rest of the year. Yeah, it's pretty similar. I mean, you know, in the springtime that you're going to have a few spring kings around, it's going to be a lot of lake trout and a few steelhead. As you get into June and July, it's going to be a lot more lake trout, lesser kings. And then, of course, August into September, you're getting the staging kings. You, you know where the fish are going to want to be at certain times. But with Lake Michigan being so big and so accessible, every year we get patterns that are different. But if you, like you already said, if you know the, the general location where you need to be, you can start dialing in your, your program from there. All right. Uh, we got another little comment here from Jim Lemon that I like. He says, another good way to catch more fish is to get up <laughs> at 4 a.m. to get the morning bite. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. Our, our charter, my charter takes off at 5 a.m. And I'm telling you, by the time I get out there in August, there's, nor there's normally 100 boats that have already beat me out there. So we talked about finding fish and trying to find the right spots, and we've talked about speed. So I guess that's the next question is if someone's going out there and they're going to get set up and maybe they're new to the game, what what speed should they be looking for? I and mean, that's just something that uh, – or how do you find that speed, I guess, is even a better question. Well, um, how do you find the right speed? Or hanging behind you. If you don't have a fish hog down there on your probe or a probe down on your, on your cannonball, you're really just guessing anyway. 
My, my typical starting speed in the morning is 2.0 to 2.2 miles an hour at the probe. You got to remember that's at the probe, not, not speed over ground. Speed over ground versus speed at the probe can be vastly different. So I'm 2.0 to 2.2 to start off. I like to take my boat in the morning, keep it on a nice straight track. As the sun starts coming up more and more, I, I like to start zigzagging, moving into different depths, varying my speeds, varying my presentations, and I let the fish just talk to me. If I'm if I'm getting bit all the time on my outside boards when I'm making a turn, I know that they might want a little faster speed. Vice versa, if I'm getting bit on the inside boards on a turn, they might want a little slower speed. But there's nothing wrong with starting off at about 2.0 to 2.2 for your morning bite. That's a real good general speed that works for me almost daily. All right, so I think we've gone over location, we've gone over speed, we've gone over temperature. Now we'll get into the, the part that everybody likes to talk about. <laughs> what new color do I need to buy? <laughs> <laughs> right. So you want to talk about lure selection? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. All right, we can do that. Now I'll, I'll skip down here to number four. So I already said this. Um, I have an A group of lures and I have a B group of lures. My A group are things that have caught fish for me in the past, whether it be a, a flasher fly, a flasher meat rig, a plug, a spoon. I keep those in the back of my mind, which ones I think are going to be working at that time, based on what I've seen in the past years, based on what the based on what the sun's doing, if it's overcast, foggy, whatnot. Those things sit in the back of my mind, and I rarely change them. So if I'm talking like late or morning versus late morning, early morning, low heavy spoons are always in my mix. Moonshine, Streamweavers, they both have some great glow spoons. Um, Moonshine regular and RV, super slim spoons, flashers with glow, uh, with glow properties, glow plugs. And early in the morning, I'm about a 70-30 ratio, which means that uh, I'm more, I'm about 70% spoons versus about 30% uh, otherwise, which would be a flasher, fly, me rig, whatnot. As the uh, as it gets mid to late morning, my ratio changes normally 50 to 50, 50% 50 spoons, 50% meat rigs or others. And I start working down in the deeper waters. You know, as the sun comes up more and more, those kings want to find that colder water. They're not actively actively feeding as much. They're going to look uh, to go take a break, take a little siesta with their full bellies. They're going to work down the deeper water columns. Um I really, I really depend on darker colors in those in those deeper depths. Blacks, reds, purples, and blues seem to work really, really well. Big paddles, the big Dreamweaver 11-inch paddles with a long lead, at least a 35, 36-inch lead with a good juicy fly into that thing. That thing can pay off for you almost daily in those deeper depths. But like I said, I'm about 50-50 at that time, 50% spoons versus 50% other things. And I'm starting to fish more and more down past the thermocline, uh, where I'm probably more like 80% down in the thermocline or below and 20% up above it looking for a straggler. All right, Jim Lemon's got a question here. Uh, he'd like to know, with ro rotating attractors, how do you keep them from twisting up the main line? Good swivels. Uh, <laughs> good swivels pay off. I run all Dreamweaver swivels. They do great. Uh, run double swivels if you need to. But I typically don't have a lot of problem with twisting line with the Dreamweaver swivels. There you go. So I got another question here, and I don't really know anything about this, but Johnny had asked it earlier in the day. Um, so I'm going to ask you, and I, I don't know anything about this, so hopefully you can educate us on this. Uh, Johnny says, are you concerned that the new consent agreement is going to have an effect on sport fishing out of Manistee? Do you know what? I don't know anything about that. Yeah, we've, we've done a couple videos on that, uh, talking about the consent decree and uh, its possible impact on that. You know, it, it's really easy to, to start running around and telling everybody the sky is falling right now, and we really don't know much about it. There are some concerns out there, and I share a few, but until we start seeing everything put into place, I'm not going to start sheltering uh, before I know enough about it. So we'll see how it plays out, but there are some concerns out there by a lot of people. Yeah. Lance, you have anything else for? Uh, no, I just I I again just appreciate what he does. Um, I, I I I always enjoy watching good teachers, right? Fishing education um, is not me and Joe went fishing. We used a blue Rapala, go buy a blue Rapala, uh, and there's too many guys that do that. The problem with the internet is there's a lot of noise. There's very few good pieces of information, 
And Chris is one of those guys that, that's always on point, always understands the process and teaches the guys the process. And um, really appreciate how he does, how he does what he does. Thank you very much. You know what they say about teachers. So if you can't do it yourself. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I never said I was a good fisherman. I'm just good at YouTube, I guess. <laughs> That's what I always tell people. I'm not a celebrity, but I play one on the internet. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have one more question here. This one's coming in from Nick Cook. A late question for you. Uh, standard versus mag spoon. Do they have much difference in strikes? Uh, you got to right? let the fish tell you what they want. Uh, one thing I do is when I clean my fish, I take a look in the inner, I look at look, look in the stomach, and I see what size the bait fish are. If I'm seeing a lot of big alewives, I'm running more mag spoons, if, and vice versa. If I'm seeing small alewife, I'm running smaller spoons. Again, let the fish tell you what they want, and it's going to change season to season, week to week, day to day. But that's a great way to get an idea of what you might want to be running. Very good. If you want to learn more about salmon fishing, again, Tangled Tackle Fishing on YouTube, great place to go. Chris, basically, like I said, he does a seminar on on uh, his YouTube channel and does a lot of Q&A stuff there and lets people ask questions just like what we're doing here and just kind of sits down and, and teaches the science of... And he does it right. Yeah, he, he does teaches it, awesome it right. So. Thanks, so guys. You, appreciate that. Yeah, if you're looking for more information, head over to the Tangled Tackle Fishing YouTube channel. Chris, uh, thanks so much for joining us on the show tonight. My pleasure, guys. Anytime. You take care. Be safe.